So that's all what we are going to do. Let me just lay out the solution step. So the solution step is this. Uh, first, uh, so, um, so you have a fairly simple differential equation. So the very first solution step is find uh, general solutions to Schrodinger equation. And that will be pretty quick. You kind of know what the answers are already. And then um, uh, general solution to Schrodinger equation for all regions separately. Then um, what you are going to end up is you are going to end up with some number of equations and a number of free parameters. And the rest of the goal in solution step is to reduce the number of free parameters by um, applying boundary conditions. So a second step is reduce uh, free parameters Um, that's in the general solution by applying boundary condition. Or um, in your differential equations class, they would call this uh, finding or find specific solution. Is that the term? Particular. Find the particular solutions. For the, um, for the initial condition, or in our case, the boundary condition. So let me go through that step for this. This is, as I said, the easiest, easiest case. So it doesn't take that long. So let me just do that. Um, so for region one, the Schrodinger equation we are trying to solve is this one. Uh, let me rewrite it in a format where you can kind of guess the answer pretty easily. So I'm going to solve it for the second derivative. Then I have for the Schrodinger equation, second position derivative is equal to, move all the constants over, minus 2me over h bar squared psi x. Have you seen something like this before? Yeah, where have you seen it? Simple harmonic oscillator, two derivatives, get the same function back, and uh, you have negative coefficient in front. Right? Now, um, so it's easy for you to say, oh, then my solution is um, psi of x is, in general, a um, cosine of kx plus b sine of kx, where k is defined as square root of 2me over h bar squared. It's easy for you to say that. Uh, let me write down the different version because the problem with this version is that both, neither of these cosine and sine have a very clear, physically assignable meaning. So it kind of gets uh, mixed up. So I want to use the complex exponential version. Because with the complex exponential version, there is a clear physical meaning we can assign to, and that will help us reduce number of free parameters. So instead of this, I'm going to say this. Psi over x is still two coefficients. Coefficient a times e to the i kx plus coefficient b times e to the minus i kx. Their case is still defined the same way square root of 2me, and I pulled out h bar so that now it's just divided by h bar. Okay? And you can see how by combining these coefficients differently, you, get can, you can get cosine, you can get sine, right? So they will cover the same space of functions. All right, so that's, uh, uh, oh. so that's the general solution for psi 1, the, the, um, the wave function in region 1 and this is really should be k1, 
Let me just uh, start using different uh, symbols so that I'm tracking them correctly. Uh, let me do that for region two. Region two will be uh, not that much different. So for region two, as I said, this is the simplest case it's because it's kind of boring. So I get this. Um, this um, the second time, sorry, position derivative wave function is equal to minus, and let me write out all the coefficients um, here. Minus 2m e minus v naught over h bar squared psi of x. Has anything here really changed from here? Yeah, not really, right? E minus v naught is still positive, which means this coefficient is still negative overall. So you still get oscillatory solution. So that's what I mean. This is the boring case. <laughs> it's one same solution just over and over again. So it's uh, psi 2x is, well, it could be different coefficients. So let's do uh, c e to the i, this time k2x plus d e to the minus i k2x where k2 is square root of 2n e minus v naught over h bar. Good? Yeah. It seems all boring until you start counting the number of unknowns and trying to reduce the free parameters. So um, some of the things got determined right out of the gate. These k parameters, they are defined in terms of the energies and potential, so that's all known. These are your unknowns, a, b, c, d, which means potentially we have to find four equations to determine all those. Let's just, uh, in this step two, let's just try to count the number of equations we can write down. Um, I think I can write down one equation, this, right? I plug in x equals zero to here and here, say that they are equal to each other. In fact, let me write it down. I kind of need it eventually anyway. So let me write down, um, so I have one equation. Um, when I plug in x equals zero, this becomes one. Plug in x equals zero, this becomes one. This is why I kind of wanted the boundary to be at x equals zero. It makes my life easy. <laughs> so it becomes, all right, a plus b is equal to c plus d. All right. That's one so far. I need three more. Um, where can I find my other equations? Are there more boundary conditions to apply? Yeah, there's one left. I can try this. Yeah. Um, and so that means I have to take the derivative, plug in x equals 0, and then set them equal to each other that way. So um, in fact, because these are exponentials, the derivatives are kind of easy. Each time you take the derivative, I just get a factor of i k coming down. And when I plug in x equals 0, this will be 1 again. So the second equation, I can kind of do it in my head and write it down this way. Just double check me and see if I did everything correct. Second equation will be i k1 times a times 1. And oh, it'll be minus i k1. So it'll be minus i k1 b is equal to, that's the left hand side. And the right hand side is the derivative of this. So i k c minus oops two i k two d. Everything looks correct there. Okay, yeah, but that was actually simple enough calculation, which is why we can do it. Um, I still need two more equations. Yeah. So what it will come down to is that this is an underspecified problem. If I simply said, here's a step, find me solutions that fit the step, uh, I haven't specified enough. Uh, I have to give you a very particular physical situation to be able to expect some concrete answer out of that. It, it's different from this bound state infinite square well. 
in that I cannot simply say, you know, if we have a step and put a particle near it, it could just go infinitely far away. That could be a solution, and it's a very uninteresting solution. So what I would instead do is let me specify this situation. I am going to say I have this step, and I actually have a particle that's moving towards the step, meaning I have an incident wave that's coming from left to right. That actually allows me to reduce this down to a single free parameter because one of these two states represent a solution state that's traveling to the right, and one of these two states represent a solution state traveling to the left. Any guesses which is which? Which way does this, uh, do you guess this one travels? To the right, and this one you guess travels to the left? Yeah, that would be the correct guess. And wait, yeah, that is the correct guess. And the way to double check it is using the momentum operator. Remember, this is the momentum of operator, minus i h bar derivative with respect to x. So if you apply the momentum operator and you get positive momentum, that means it's moving to the right. If you get negative momentum, that means it's moving to the left. Yeah? So, by so by focusing on that very particular situation, we can say, all right, my incoming particle is, um, oh, oh. OK, I have to be careful here. My incoming particle is moving from left. And I think that does not mean I can eliminate B. Because that, this just reminded me, there could be a reflected wave <laughs> that's coming back. So I have to leave this B alone. But what I can get rid of is this B. Because after the barrier, the only thing that's after the barrier is what, that, what got through. There's nothing that's coming from the right to the left. So I can get rid of this. So I can get rid of D here. I can get rid of this D here. All right. Um, I still need one more way to reduce the number of free parameters. So this is, I guess, a question of um, what you want to find out. So this is the question you can ask. Um, so you are looking at the, so think of this like a light, light uh, incident on some transparent surface, like, uh, I, I don't know, I don't have anything transparent. But you know, if this is glass, you've seen it how some light reflects, some light is transmitted. And in that case, if I'm wanting to find out the property of this barrier, Really what I want to know is, uh, well, what is the reflectivity? What is the transmittivity? What, um, how much of the instant wave goes through? How much of the instant wave reflects? So here, instead of trying to find, find out the exact number of the particles that go through, or probably there's something getting through, you can try to find the ratio. Essentially, what you would be limiting yourself to is trying to figure out, well, what is the ratio? of C over A, which would be related to how much particle is transmitted, and the ratio um, B over A, which would be related to how much particle is reflected. So in other words, you know, instead of, um, so I guess you can, uh, um, here's maybe one way to kind of mathematically represent that. One way to mathematically represent that would be to say my A, I'm going to say my A is equal to 1. Okay? And then whatever value of B and C I get is that uh, what this ratio would be if I didn't say that my A is equal to 1. Okay? So I can say, all right, um, this A, let me just set that equal to 1. And this A, let me just set that equal to 1. Okay? Then now I have two equations two unknowns, B and C, now I can solve for it. So let me solve for it and just to show you some physical meaning of the result you get. Because I think it's uh, um, actually an interesting result that you should see that agrees with your intuition. So, all right, um, let me just rewrite this. I made a lot of modifications here. So one plus B is equal to C. That's what that says, one plus B is equal to C. Um, I can actually cancel out i. It's in every single term. So let me cancel out i. Then what this says is, um, 
ki times 1, so minus kib is equal to k2c. All right, um, I guess uh, it's just a simple algebra to go through. Um, let me <laughs> try to reduce the number of steps because I'm running out of space. So, oops, oh, wow, um, sorry. I don't know how that happened. Because uh, I'm kind of running out of space here. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply this through by ki, or at least I'm imagining that I do that. Because once I do that, I can do linear combination. When I add these two together, I'll get rid of b. Right? So by doing linear combination, adding them together, what I end up with is um, ki plus ki, so 2 ki is equal to uh, ki plus k2. So ki plus k2 um, c. And I can solve for C um, as, so C is equal to um, 2ki, uh, 2ki over, or, or 2k1 divided by k1 plus k2. And uh, let me just, uh, uh, from these two expressions, remind you that k1 is always greater than k2. Because k2 is uh, where you take the number, subtract something, so it's always a smaller number. So all right, so this is one result. That's the coefficient to see. Um, and to get b, you would subtract them. Um, so wait, you do subtract? No, sorry, you don't subtract them. All right, it's a little bit longer. I, I think it's actually simpler to do it this way. Um, no, with what's the simplest um, here? Simplest thing to do is to plug this in for C here and solve for B here. So um, doing that, I get B is equal to um, C minus one. So that minus one to Ki over Ki plus K two. Minus one, or um, or um, turning this minus one into a more interesting fraction of k one plus k two over k one plus k two. Uh, then, and when you do the subtraction, one of this cancels out one of that, and I have minus k two. So you end up with um, this whole thing is equal to k1 minus k2 divided by k1 plus k2. So this is the coefficient b. Good. Any questions? There are some. Um, Wait, did I do everything right? Guess I did do everything right. Um, let me just to make sure I did. Um, some result isn't quite looking the way I want it to. Um, yeah, I didn't make any mistakes, right? Ki. And dividing by the sum, mm. I guess that's correct. I was trying to see if I can intuitively guess what the result should be. Um, you know, so I'm trying to think, okay, what's an interesting energy level to look at? Um, 
where while E is still greater than V0, well, I guess an interesting energy level to look at is right here, where E is barely greater than, um, where E is barely greater than V0. So in that case, I can say K2 goes to zero, and K1 is just some value, and what I was a kind of hoping to be able to say is that transmission probability is zero. But I don't think that's the case. At least if I did this right, um, add them, it's 2k1. Um, k1, add that. Oh, I, I think I know. I've made this mistake in the past. Um, I know what I, <laughs> I'm getting off to. Um, it has to do the calculating the uh, actual probability. Um, let's see. I don't want to get too deep into that. Um, so let, let me look at the other limit. The other limit is easier. So. Um, we have some reflected probability, right? And when you look at this answer, there's at least one thing you can kind of infer from that. So, you know, simple thing to infer, the larger the B is, the greater the probability that particle will be reflected, right? So looking at this number here, um, so, Um, so if the energy, if the energy is much greater than V0, then these two numbers are going to become very similar to each other. So um, in the limit that energy goes, in, in the limit, in the limit that energy goes to infinity, this number will go to zero. So we can say that um, if your incoming energy is much larger than the step size, then the probability of something being reflected is zero, okay? or it approaches zero, which is what you would expect classically or whatever. Okay? Um, the other thing that, uh, so that's something that matches your intuition and list uh, says that this result is not completely out of touch with the reality. The other thing that's interesting is, um, in the uh, simpler limit where, I don't know, if uh, your E is equal to 2V0, then this is definitely not zero. Where you have some step size, and if your incoming energy is double the step size, even though you have plenty of energy coming in, you have some non-zero probability of things being reflected. In fact, um, in fact, here's how you can calculate reflection probability. Um, so these are coefficients. And what, you, uh, what I hope you kind of remember from what we were covering with the quantum mechanics before is um, psi, it gives, you the, um, it gives you the wave function amplitude, right? And um, this word amplitude, it has no physical meaning. It um, doesn't correspond to anything you can measure physically. Um, what does have physical meaning is the psi absolute value squared. That corresponds to probability density. And it corresponds to, in the case of traveling particles, it corresponds to intensity how much energy is coming in. So here, 
if you want to calculate reflectivity or reflectance, the ratio of the incoming number of particles and the reflected number of particles, what you really need to calculate is B absolute value squared. So what you need to calculate is B absolute value squared. And that gives you this result. So taking this, squaring both sides, you end up with uh, Ki minus K2. Mm, I don't know. I guess it's just uh, doesn't do anything interesting. Ki plus K2 squared. Um, and um, I guess that gives you the reflectivity. <laughs> um, and uh, before we go into break, let me just uh, leave with this comment. Um, does everyone here have intuition that um, number of reflected particles and the number of transmitted particles should do, you know, add up to the total number incident? Right? So what that intuition will maybe lead you into saying is b squared plus c squared is equal to 1. And I will tell you right now, if you try to check that with this, you will see that they don't equal 1 when you square them and add them. So that's the question mark. Are they really equal to 1? They are not. And the little part that takes a little bit too much time for us to work through, so I'm not going to do that. The part that you have to account for is the velocity. How quickly are the particles moving? So uh, for B, it's actually simple, because the incident and outgoing, they are moving at the same speed. So any uh, factor relating to velocity cancels out. But the outgoing side is where your velocity changes because you've taken up some potential energy, now you have less kinetic energy, that means smaller velocity. So this is something you never had to deal with with light, but now you have to deal with for matter waves. So there's a missing factor here, which, uh, I don't know, missing factor. Factor for change in velocity, which takes too much work to work it out, at least for the purpose of this class, so we want. It actually doesn't take that much work, but we are trying to cover a lot in a short amount of time, so we'll skip that. Um, so, 